Semple, where were you born or where did you grow up? Yeah, so I'm from San Diego, California. Okay. And I thought your name was Andrea because of the Spanish influence. Oh, interesting. It's Andrea now, right? It is Andrea. Okay. It's okay, though. No, Goof. no worries. If you call me Andrea, that's totally okay, too. I'm not very specific on how my name – I mean, I have – a preference, obviously, but um, the fact that you remember my name is more important than how you pronounce it. Um, I grew up in Dana Point, so that's interesting. Oh, okay, Dana yeah. Point. Yeah, not too far away from San Diego. Yeah, okay, so very cool. I'm a Southern California native, too. Did you like growing up in San Diego? Yeah, um, I wasn't exactly in the exciting part, necessarily, but <laughs> I was in the, you know, North County kind of surfer community. And, um, okay. It was great growing up. It's totally overdeveloped now. Yeah, I know. Right? It's not the same. Were we, when, I'm sorry, like, were you there 70s, 80s? Oh, no, no, no. I was born in 86. So, okay. well, so technically in the 80s. But 80s, okay. I don't have any memories. Mostly 90s. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I'm older than you. <laughs> Yeah, I grew up in the 70s. So in, I, I don't know in, what it was like back then, but I know it's changed a lot since I was a kid. Yeah, in Southern Orange County, it was yeah. primarily um, orange groves and strawberry fields before Irvine became Irvine. I can't even imagine that. Yeah, it was it was very, very different. And I grew up in a, I mean, you could say it was rural. It was more rural um, in the sense that uh, we could ride a horse and, and ride out quite far without you know being around houses or yeah so it was it was pretty undeveloped at the time sounds it, amazing it was um in that regard it was amazing yeah i used to pretend that i was like uh laura ingalls wilder you know living out on the prairie or something mm -hmm. and did you still retain your southern california driving habits or did you slow down <laughs> and get it's lazier and so I was just having a Portland. conversation about this yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I have definitely. I mean, I, I just, perfect example is right before this podcast, I was rushing home to go get the key, right? So, um, oh, okay. no, I still drive like a Californian and Oregonians um, are... I think more patient, I think more patient or at least more what appears to be conscientious. Yeah. But then also on the flip side of that, more oblivious to the people that are around them, which yeah. I think is infuriating for a Californian. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I'll speak for myself. I don't no, know I, about I you. I agree. I think it's kind of like failure to see the forest for the trees kind of deal. And yeah. Thinking about the individual themselves and nothing happens outside of the self when they're on the road. And <laughs> yes. I'm thinking about greater traffic patterns and how to effectively navigate roads. And or just not impact the people around me. Yeah. Not slow down to a complete stop before I turn right, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Definitely. I totally get it. So. Okay, good. I'm glad we agree on that. Sure. Name something that you cannot live without. Oh, my gosh. See, this is a funny question because this is the sort of thing. I, I work in dating, obviously, and I, I help people with their profiles. I, d I don't design their profiles for them, but rather I want them to have the intuition to do it for the rest of their life. So I kind of encourage them and get them to do their own drafts and things and we revise together but um it just it's such a prompt question on profiles like name five things you can't live without and um so it's, it's such an interesting question um for me that's a really tough one because um, i'm gonna avoid things like oxygen and water and food uh to answer that question of course <laughs> um what could i not live without well, I suppose I couldn't live life without dancing. You honestly. like to dance. It's been a little while because of this pandemic thing going on, but but yeah, you've got to let loose. And gosh, you know, some of my clients can use a little bit more of the letting loose and everything. They're a little bit stiff and need to have some fun. So yeah, dancing is a big part of my history. And um, that doesn't always mean in any kind of formal structure necessarily, but... But yeah, it's important to be silly to play, isn't it? I agree. Yeah. Um, so no formal history or background in dance for you? Um, some salsa dancing, swing dancing, absolutely. I, I'm just 
I'm unpracticed because the pandemic kind of shut those things down for a while. Yeah. And then I, I took on new interests, right? Trying to adapt to that situation. And, right. and now it's kind of back right now, but I'm, I'm caught up in other things. So yeah, soon enough, we're getting back into it. That's fun. Yeah. That's really fun. I haven't forgotten. You I haven't. Just, just took a vacation. That's yeah. All. I love to dance too. Great. Um, Tell me something unique or interesting about you that only those close to you would know. Well, I'm a dating coach, for one, as a career. And um, there are some other dating coaches, but mostly what you have are you have a lot of people um, tossing around the word dating coach and what that actually means could be anything. So there's people who are dating coaches who actually don't do anything with dating whatsoever, or very, very, very just shallowy kind of relation to it. Um, so I'd say it's, it's pretty unique, honestly. Um, I think there's some, some other people who kind of work in that related industry in Portland. Um, but in my research, I found a lot of them aren't necessarily active or maybe don't really work on the practical aspects of coaching, but they work on certain niche areas, which is fine. Um, so, you know, to, to put it bluntly, yeah, I, it's a completely unique thing in, in at least in Portland, Oregon for me. And I, I actually take customers all around the country, but, um, but I'm based in Portland, of course. And that's kind of how I marketed myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how is, well, we'll just jump into that. I had a discussion sure. anyway. How did you become a dating coach and why? Oh, it's, it's really quite simple. Well, the how is really quite simple. Okay. I put up a website one day. Uh huh. That's it. Okay. I put up a website. People started coming to me little by little. I had this rule at first, no more than three customers at a time, which means of course that wasn't my full-time job. Right. That was just the side gig that I was experimenting with, but um, developed it over time. Didn't take on too too much of a workload until I could really refine the program and get it to where I, where I want. And, um, back then, I only charged fifty dollars an hour, which is just not a livable income, honestly. Especially if you're only taking three people at a time. Yes. But um, <laughs> you know, so it was practice, right? So yeah, slowly, yeah. slowly, slowly. We, everyone yeah, starts somewhere. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't exactly do it for free either. That didn't make any sense. So no. Yeah, okay. had to had to get something for it, but. Um, but you asked me why, mm -hmm. and why is the really interesting part? There's, it's a two-parter. Okay. So for one, I, I got my bachelor's in psychology, realized I didn't want to work into clinical because it just, I was a little naive when I entered college and um, clinical, it was a little bit more boring than than what I had in mind. I, mm -hmm. I thought for some reason this would be all all just fun and excitement, and um, there's some very heavy kind of slow going stuff in clinical and like therapy. It's just not for me. You mm -hmm. know, I admire those who do it, but just wasn't for me. And I barely even knew research kind of aspect existed, but I fell into that and I actually ended up really loving it. Mm. And at the same time to work a career in research, it meant mostly spreadsheets and editing manuscripts. And um, I think there's a lot of glory because you'd get to go to conferences and present your work as I have done before. But, um, you know, it, it, wasn't enough like of the applied being able to work directly with people and help them and benefit them. It was, it's just a lot of the backstage stuff, which again, super important. Right. Um, but I, I kind of wanted a mix. I wanted something creative where I could help people directly, but also um, get to work with just research and the knowledge base I had and realize there's a lot of great, just a lot of great peer reviewed research out there on dating science, if you will, science of relationships, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the universities aren't necessarily training for that. Um, they are training for like the marriage family therapy degree. Mm -hmm. um, of course, if you want to go into that counseling role, but th they weren't training anyone to be a, a dating therapist, right? That doesn't exist at the university level. So, right. so I made it up. I became one basically because I liked the idea and I liked that I had a good knowledge base of it. I liked that I had the skills to look up more information and to conduct research to at least some degree. Yeah. Um, and there was an, there was something else that influenced this too. Uh, around the time where this was happening and I was thinking of moving to Portland and I was thinking about what I wanted to do career-wise, pickup artistry was getting really popular. I mean, there were... Uh -huh. There was this book, The Game. 
I know Neil. It came, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. No yeah. kidding. And it's a brilliant read. <laughs> yeah. It is absolutely brilliant. Um, but I think, you know, a book like that comes out and these communities start getting really, really popular. And they did. Um, things were developing. And I actually started talking to some people so, sort of haphazardly. And they're like, well, I, I paid $5,000 for this boot camp where I go and we, you know, we prospect women at clubs or whatever. Yep. And I'm like, well, how did it work? Like it didn't, I got, I actually got slapped and yeah. um, it was just a complete waste of $5,000. And they, they tell me some of the things that they were taught. I'm just thinking like, this is total bunk. Yeah. It is total bunk. Yeah. It, um, it, the method wasn't good. It wasn't ethical. Bes besides the ethics, it just didn't work, it sounded like, or maybe it worked for a, a few select people. But so there was kind of this fiery rage inside of me, just, um, you know, again, the ethical standpoint. And then I'm like, wow, there's there's scammers just taking people's money. Yes. And, and not helping anyone. Yeah. And so between That's in, that, in, in any industry, though, right? <laughs> I suppose so. Especially in my industry, right? People are very skeptical of psychics. <laughs> fair enough, fair yeah. enough. But but if you're doing the service right, you mm -hmm. get the reputation. And um, most of the people come to me, it's word of mouth these days. Or So I believe it is. I don't actually do a lot of heavy marketing. That's but awesome. I get a lot of referrals coming in from psychologists, from therapists and things like that. That's awesome. And they're people that I don't even know, but they're, they know my name and they're passing me around. So, um, so that, I hope that answers your question. Basically yeah. love for research, wanting to do something creative and then, you know, fight, fight the pickup artist kind of. <laughs> Good for you. How yeah. long have you been a Portland dating coach? Oh, it's been five, six years. Okay. I kind of forgot to be honest. Yeah, it's it's been at least five years. And yeah, you've been doing it full time now, as opposed it's to full time. Yeah, and yes. initially, so initially you were kind of testing it out, similar to how I was with the program that I built, um, maybe with not friends and family, but extended people that you know might be interested. Oh, in it. were you using friends and family? Uh, yeah, okay. absolutely. On my program, 100% yes, because I don't live in a bubble. So I wanted feedback from everyone. And I wanted, you know, it's it's a pretty intense program. It's an intensive. So I wanted objective feedback from every person, not just people that, you know, were paying me or, you know. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, and, and you, if you're anything like my industry um you, there's probably not a lot of role models out there are there like you, you don't know how to structure your business you don't know who to follow for my business i made it up similar to you it's a combination yeah. of two different things right um it's a combination of trauma psychology or you know um a basis of psychology and then also using your intuitive gifts. So, you know, not a lot of people are doing that. And I teach people how to heal on a physical, emotional, and spiritual level, right? So the lesson actually passes through them as opposed to getting stuck in one of those energetic boundaries. So um, mm. that's that's unique to me, but that's also based on the fact that, you know, I, I worked um, in the tech industry in the Bay Area for 20 years doing something completely different and had an entire different business mentality before I even started this and was definitely less on the woo-woo side. Okay. <laughs> you know, I started out less woo-woo. I wasn't raised woo-woo. So, you know, in that regard, like there's some grounding there, right? I'm sure. not like, you know... Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't make fun, but uh, you know, I'm not like wearing tie dyed skirts and, you know, <laughs> sure, sure. I totally, understand. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, there's more of a science base to what I do. That's great. That's, mm. that's important. I it think, is. So. Yeah. Well, it, it speaks to a larger population, right? And especially with men, um, men to be, tend to be, I'm not going to generalize, but they tend to be more logically focused than intuitively based. So um, speaking to them in, in that aspect or getting in from that direction tends to help, you know, give them greater awareness or understanding into the spiritual component of that. So. Wow. Well, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And th that's great. I think you, um, you've got it grounded, as you said, I think that's, that's wonderful. And, um, I thought this would be a really interesting conversation because I, I have to do kind of the opposite in many ways, because, um, 
I, I think there's a really great place for what you're doing here. Hmm. And at the same time, I there's so many clients I have that I can try going into them with some of this stuff. But other than the fact it's just not my specialty, a lot of them are just going to speak in very, you know, a lot of them are businessmen or businesswomen. Mm-hmm. They speak in very just kind of surface practical terms. Mm-hmm. And they're, they'll be just be like, I just, just can you get me good photos for my profile <laughs> kind of thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> certainly have a lot of people too who need the healing. And um, sometimes yeah. what that means is I don't know what to do with them, honestly, uh-huh. except to say I, I want you to put a pause on your program. I want you to go seek out a therapist. I want you to do, you know, you are jumping way work. too into this just, yeah. just quickly. Yeah. Um, particularly if they recently went through a divorce, which is a lot of my clients. Aha. Uh-huh. So. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, interesting just based upon the fact that I'm at the tail end of one myself. So why do you think that is that most of your clients are going through a divorce or have just recently been through a divorce because there's such a long period of time between the time that they dated and and the time that they are single again? There's um, when people decide to start up again, it, it varies heavily. There's, there's actually a lot of clients who get the divorce and they try, they want to kind of jump into it right after. And I usually see that as like a Band-Aid on a wound that needs to heal. Mm. Um, so I can actually reliably predict where like, uh, you know, I'll give them the coaching. I'll help them with what I can. But I can predict when some things are going to collapse for them and they're going to say like, oh, no, 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 I, d- I don't have any confidence. I, I can't handle this right now. I'm like, yeah, it's um that, that would have been my guess too, honestly. And I'll tell them, I'll forewarn them, right? But if someone goes right from, say, I've, I've got a client right now, second divorce, um, really traumatic details behind the divorce too. Uh-huh. So it's now his second time. He's 40. And um, the divorce only happened a few months ago. And so I'm I'm kind of just reading the patterns like this is your second divorce, traumatic circumstances, and and you're talking about your it's kind of like a sort of regression. Like I want to date a bunch of women and I think that'll make me feel better. And I'm like, okay, I already I already know what this is, and it's not gonna work right now. I'm gonna help you as much as I can, but I'm ready to kind of prepare them with, okay, you're going to need to pause this once you realize you can't take this right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. You need to do more healing. Um maybe you know same time next year type mm, thing and they'll be mm. in a much much better place but mm. so i see a lot of that of course and um you said you're on the tail end of your divorce yes i'm a little bit jealous oh. of your client who got divorced a couple months ago because mine's taken almost two years oh really yeah i think it took three years for my parents if that makes you feel better <laughs> uh yes i know mean, but yes I mean, you, you, what you're saying is it could always be worse. And sure. I get that. Yes. I remind myself of that almost every morning that I wake up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. Um, anyway, it's statistically normal at this point. So that it would take two years. That everyone's getting divorced. Oh, that everyone's getting divorced. Yeah. That's statistically normal now. Well, tell me I, more. I'm never sure about those numbers because by the time they study this stuff, it's it's a new generation. Uh-huh. They follow people's patterns. And so when we talk about divorce statistics, whether it's 40 or 50 percent, we're really looking at, you know, like what our parents did. And, and we don't know what it'll be like for us necessarily. But are but, your were your parents boomers? Yeah, they were boomers. That's weird. The lights just went out. Oh, hold on just a second. Sure. So. Back to you. Sure. <laughs> we were talking about um, whether or not your parents were boomers. Yes. Yes. They were boomers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I, I don't know exactly what the percentage of divorce is, but I know that it's high. Yeah. I know for something that you invest so much in and, and just have so much to lose on, it is way too high of a rate. Mm-hmm. Well, my experience of boomers, at least, I mean, mine are um, at the probably at the higher end mm-hmm. than yours, um, just based upon our age. But um, that generation was taught to hang in no matter what, right? It's a, a level of commitment. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter if you're suffering. You just, you're, there's too much 
concern or uh, fear around uh, leaving your partner when that's all you've known or you've been together since your early 20s or, um, you know, you're getting older in life. And um, I find that that generation had a lot of fear and uh, around leaving their partners and, and starting over. And um, when it comes to, let's say, my generation, Gen X, um, I find that we kind of spearheaded that in, in a lot of ways. I feel like we are kind of the generation that um, chose to not do that just based upon the fact that our parents were in marriages that were often unhappy and um, I don't know, that's, that's at least my perspective. I don't know. I haven't done the research, but um, I just know that, you know, in in talking with my parents or talking with more people that age, that um, it's not even something that they would consider. Yeah. Um, it's not exactly an area that I have specialist knowledge in either. I only kind of, I hear what I hear. Yes. Um, but, you know, dad, he's on marriage number three and it's just, you know, hey, if, if this takes so much time and energy and it's it's not working then you know why do you keep doing it i, I mean if it if it had a higher success rate it might make more sense to me um i'm trying actually not to think about marriage until later in life so okay yeah and is there a specific reason why not later not until later in life well this is simplistic. or why would you consider course. it at all i guess is my point this is simplistic but um we know that the biggest predictor of a failed marriage is age when first married. Really? Yes. Yes. That at least when I studied this stuff, it was, it's possible it's changed over the course of 10 years, but yeah, there's, there's quite a few big predictors. There's the age when first married. That's the one I look to the most, which is why the 19 year olds just, they're just not going to make it, frankly. Well, because they don't have the maturity to even yeah. know what they want or who they are. Yeah. Now yeah. that obviously that uh, tapers off, that, that trend tapers off a bit once you've reached a certain age in adulthood. Um, I still don't know exactly what it is. I've heard 30 is actually optimal. But um, but it, like I said, it's always changing. And so uh -huh. it, like, where are you getting your research from? Was it from a few decades ago? Uh -huh. Like, We don't really know. So um, I'll play it safe and wait a little bit longer, I think. Have you reached 30? Oh, yeah. No, I, so I am <laughs> 36 right now. Okay, okay. I think I'll wait until 40. Okay. And then when you look at that, you still got, what, 30 to 40 years, um, you know, together with someone if you get married. That's a long time. Mm. And um, that's satisfactory for me. And I th think I'll know myself even better by then, so why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I knew myself a lot better by 40, for sure, than at 26. Sure, I was married sure. for, um, I was together, we were together for 22 years and married for 19. Wow. Yeah. You so. got married at 26 or? No, I 20? met him at 26. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I got married, I think, around the time I was turning 30 or just after 30, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not horrendous for no. what for what it's worth. That was actually no, I, a good I, long run. I know. I, I gave it um, every opportunity to be successful and was fully dedicated to a, a person who was not fully dedicated. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, it, I, in looking back, I couldn't have worked any harder or done anything more than I did. I really did try just about everything to keep it going that long so. oh i i know you did you've got a couple decades in there for sure <laughs> I, I know effort was made yes. to keep it going that long so. yeah yeah so yeah. all right um let's get back to you okay sure um what is your favorite thing to do when you are expressing love <sighs> um It's funny. I'm a very like kissy person. So when you say express, I know there's like all the different love languages yes. and everything. It, it's if there's, and, and I'm not talking about anything like sexual 
right necessarily but just if there's someone i'm with just that that physical touch is important and it's it's just it's almost like they're a snack and i just you know have to keep you know if you have the potato chips you you can't <laughs> you help it right them. yeah <laughs> that's why they're dangerous and you don't keep them around um it is dangerous i agree with you on the chips <laughs> That's that's probably one of my most just ultimate forms of expression of love, honestly, because I'll find myself just absent absent mindedly doing this sort of thing. And again, it's it's not even like a sexual energy or an obsession or anything like that. It's just it just seems to be a, a mode that I go through. Right? Is that your love language? I suppose so. I've I've actually never formally evaluated that, despite the fact that I work in dating and everything. But okay. Um, but it must be right based on the evidence the record shows. So, and did your was your family really affectionate? I don't think so. Okay. I I don't know. I don't think no no actually no I don't think they were at all. Okay, so there's a theory, uh, at least from what I know about love languages, that you tend to be dominant in the one that you didn't receive as a child. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe that explains it. Yeah. Kind of like That's, there's a, a lack or something. Yeah, so have to and you're trying to that. make up for it. Uh -huh. Yeah, we tend to give others what we want to receive, right? Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like, you know, people who drive around really big pickup trucks, they're they're making up for something. Yeah, right? yeah okay. exactly. I get it. I get <laughs> yeah. What qualities do you most admire in a woman? Um, you know, I'll, I'll say what I think a lot of men admire that not every man wants to say, but um, probably more a traditional sense of just being effeminate and having that sweet kind of gentle loving energy. And um, I start, I hear a lot about that in Portland because you, we, we live in, of course, an ultra liberal city and um, people are bending genders and things like that yes. and, and mixing roles. And, and that's not even a problem on any theoretical level, but I think, I think it tends to be polarized a little bit. And, um, and I think, you know, for me, that's maybe like what you were saying, there's kind of a lack of it. You start to miss it when you can't access that, but um in a very you know frank sense, you know a lot of women I think are are shedding kind of some of that feminine energy, and you feel like you're in a black hole sometimes. Like you're you're dating a lot of women who are um, you know they're not transgender, but they're happy being masculine and taking on those roles, right? And um, I in in previous years, I'd meet those women, and it was never a problem. You'd be like, okay, live and let live. But I think when everyone around you is like that or when you start to see the majority of them you you start to miss certain things and um you feel like there's maybe a lack of balance now and 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 men are doing it too other direction of course right um, i get a lot of complaints from female clients about that just the men are so soft and passive and they don't take a stand for anything and um, they don't really have a sense of ownership or driving or directing things and so I think we all kind of miss the other side, right? Mm. Yeah, some of the more traditional roles. And and this is coming, it's coming from men who are very liberal, of course, and very open to these things. It's coming, same thing with women. It's coming from um, like self-identified feminist women. They're like, well, yeah, I'm all about feminism, but I kind of miss dating men who just want to lead me and take me on a date and uh, pay for me, want. take me out somewhere. Yeah, exactly. They miss the experience. And, mm -hmm. and we were talking about dancing earlier. It's kind of like dancing. There's It is just like dancing. Yeah, leading, following. It's actually kind of fun to maintain some of those roles sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. That's how the dance works. So, it is. So I would say. Um, and how the masculine and feminine, feminine energy work together. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. It doesn't. We all have it in each yeah. of us. Yeah. Right. I have a theory around, and I've been talking about this lately with friends, and maybe I even mentioned it here, but I have a theory around why I can speak to women, I can't speak to men, why women become more masculine or more assertive. And this is just my own personal theory. I think if you have a background with a lot of trauma, I think it's a way of feeling like you have more control in the world and more mm. control over um, aspects of your life or more control over the people that you're relating to, ir irregardless of male or female. I think that it comes from um, protection, you know, in, in a sense of, of 
being more dominant in and aggressive in the world because you've been hurt. Yeah, that could be true. Absolutely. I've never really quite sourced it because, um, well, it's, it's just hard to know just culturally we seem to have a lot of it in portland and then it's not necessarily everywhere else right uh -huh. i think you probably see a lot of that in places like san francisco and portland and and then other places are a little bit more balanced i mean um you know m most cities probably like larger urban areas have just a, a large variety of different types of people but right but um, yeah, you could be onto something, but certainly there's a cultural effect to something, something that's happening in the Pacific Northwest, whatever yeah? that may be. Yeah. You think it's specific to the Pacific Northwest? It's not specific, like as in only to the Pacific Northwest, but um, it certainly is happening here yeah. at a larger level. Yeah. Right. And I mean, you can look at cities like New York, very liberal place, um, but also a very balanced place, I would say. And um, just give, I actually, I have in, I want to call her an agent. I have a, a mock dater in New York who works with any of the clients who live in New York. And so she's reporting things to me all the time. And, and, um, I kind of get a sense of what New York is like in dating there due to her experience and expertise. And she actually tells me, um, in New York, sometimes you have too many options. Like you have everything, you know, so you don't feel like you're pigeonholed into one thing. Cause you can always have more options, of course, but I kind of wish Portland were like that. Um, if if you're asking me this question, what's important to me, I would say I'm missing some of that. I would like some more of that kind of variety. traditional, yeah, feminine energy, you can say. And and when there's a lot of variety, you, you don't really care, you know, that not everyone is the same person, of course. Why would you want that? But when you see it very polarized kind of in one direction, you start to wonder and you start to miss things and and realize that you feel like you don't have enough options or access, right? So that would probably be, um, that not only answers your question, what do I really like to see when it comes to dating, when it comes to women, but um, probably just one of the bigger problems that the men are having in Portland and also same thing for the women. They're having the problems with the men taking on um, kind of a softer role, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they miss some of the more masculine stuff, so. And would you say that that's the greatest complaint? Um, it's a big one. Uh, the, literally the biggest complaint I get is, involves the word passivity uh, directed towards the men. But um, I, th I think I kind of interpret passivity being that, um, that they've, uh, some of them are very well-meaning. I mean, some of them are like, well, okay, we, we live in liberal Portland and, and um, you know, feminists and all that. And women can do things and they run careers and they can direct their own life. So yeah, we'll let them get the bill and we don't have to worry about things. But that, of course, caused this effect where they're, it's like the drivers. They're kind of oblivious to what's happening around them, a little bit lazy, not really aware. And um just being very lazy with dating. The men are just not really deciding things, not saying, hey, I've got this restaurant I wanna take you out to. Lead and follow, right? It's really fun to go dancing because the leader throws some moves at you and as a follow, this is a surprise, it's reactionary, it's thrilling because of that. Um, same thing with dating, you're not having that anymore because the men aren't making decisions like they used to. And why do you think that is? I think it's because a lot of they they're thinking, okay, um, let's equalize these gender roles now, and women can kind of take the reins. And women do appreciate that to a degree, of course. But um, that, and if we're being honest, we live in a very introverted city, and so a lot of men simply just don't know how to. Um, they're not very collaborative necessarily, and um, everyone's very loose about everything, and. Um, and I get, I, I've got female peers and clients sending me screenshots all the time. Look at what this guy said to ask me out on the date. And it's very much just like, you want to hang out sometime? Okay, yeah, what do you want to do? I don't really have any ideas. Just whatever you want to do, we can do. It's just that's the kind of response you're getting from a lot of men in Portland. Uh huh. And um, it's actually really fun to be taken out, to have someone decide, let's go here. There's something I want to show you. Let me get this. I'm taking you on this date. I'm directing things a little bit. I see no real harm in that. Um, if you're wondering about like balance, well, should women do it? Should they pay for the first date? Should men also pay for the first date? Yes to both. Um, but because most people, when they're pairing up, especially if they met online and they don't really know each other, they don't have time to have a conversation about that. Yeah. It's much better just to get going with the process. And should you date longer term, there's 
balance can always be reintroduced. You can take turns paying for dates. You can split things later on. That's fine. Better just to get the ball rolling, though, from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Right? And um, going back to dancing, if if you dance, right? You do partner dancing? Do I, I have done that? partner you dancing. Have. Okay. Yes. You haven't in a while. I haven't in a while. No. Okay. You're kind of like me then. Um <laughs> Could you imagine if you're on the dance floor, usually what happens is someone just comes up and he says, do you want to dance? And you say yes, or maybe you say no. Most right. people say yes. Um, if you say no, fine. But could you imagine if someone asked you, do you want to dance? And you have to say, okay, wait, stop. We need to have a conversation about this. Let's determine <laughs> our roles. Are you leading or following? Because I would actually like to lead sometimes, but you can lead sometimes. I can follow. So it would just be so weird. Yes. You know, it's much more fun just to be like, do you want to dance? Yes, let's go. Yeah. And spin out, right? Mm-hmm. I kind of see dating that way. Just get the process going. Um, I encourage men generally just Go ahead, take her out to dinner, buy it for her. Have some ideas, have some ambitions, have restaurants that you love to discover and explore. And then um, balance again, of course, inevitably wriggles into it anyway. If you're dating someone, you know, say more than one or two dates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not worth really thinking about what's fair and what's not fair. It all evens out in the end, Mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) That, That was... That was long-winded. No, it's so. fine. We just got kind of off of my question, so I'm kind of looking at I don't at even remember what your question is, <laughs> I honestly. Said, I asked you what qualities do you admire most in a woman? We're still on that question? That's oh what my we were gosh. talking about, yeah. We didn't even get to what, what you admire most in men. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So that's the problem with talking to a dating coach is it's like I can't separate these things from, You're fine. you know, um, the clients I work with You're and what fine. I advise You're and fine. what I like, but yeah. Um, so you want to ask a new question? What qualities I admire most in men? Sure. I don't think about it very much, to be honest. Okay. I don't. It's, um, because I'm so focused on as, as a male who dates females, right? I have to focus mostly on what do I admire in women? And then, um, I admire, what I admire men is kind of what I was telling you. Just it's based on what my female peers are complaining about all the time. And that is just this sort of lack of assertiveness. Mm. So if there are great guys out there, um, who are being a little bit more assertive and, and happy to kind of take someone out and show her a great time, I admire that because it makes my female peers happy. So, mm. okay. yeah. So what did you love doing as a child? <clears throat> Um, in San Diego as a child strictly as a child not as an adolescent sure as an adolescent um, what were some things that you loved doing while growing up how about that childhood was more interesting actually because adolescence okay, was we'll just go back to childhood <laughs> Adolescence was like, now that I think about it, it was just a big ball of confusion and not knowing what my place was. So I couldn't stick to anything. Okay. Um, when I was a child, mm-hmm. I did some, I did, I did quite a few years of um, martial arts and that was really fun. And I haven't touched this stuff in decades, but you remember a lot of it when it's like learning a new language when, but when you're a child, you really retain a lot of it. I, I'm not practiced of course, but but it is just it is just amazing. Like I still remember how to kill someone using a three finger jab. I was it's gonna like, say, wow. can you defend yourself if you get attacked? I think so. Good I'm, for you. I'm not very big, but I'm very fast. And I'm very brave. So I think so, but I haven't had to okay. test that too much. That's good, because homelessness in Portland is is definitely on the rise. And um I I actually got attacked outside the studio, so I... I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay, yeah. So I could have used those (laughs) those martial art lessons when I was a kid. Yeah, um, I'm very sorry to hear that. And since you brought that up, Mm. I've had a couple of peers who were almost attacked, accosted, and I was in the vicinity. And so Did you use the three-finger jab? I (laughs) did. (laughs) <laughs> need to learn from you when we're done. <laughs> it's one of those things that takes a lot of practice, even after I show you that it has to do with the solar plexus, but uh-huh. you, you know, you're not going to execute it perfectly anyway. Yeah. It, it's overkill, so to speak anyway, for yeah. a situation like that. But um, no, I've, I've had a couple situations where it it's, there's actually like this sort of political aspect to it because I have to wait for them to make the first strike. Yes. And then, you know, then I can you know, go gaga or whatever, but, um, they've, they've got to make the first strike. Yes. And so what I do is I get into a position where I'm basically ready to pounce, 
but until they do something that's way over the line. But um, yeah, I've seen some people like grabbing people like they're about to strangle them, but it's not quite at that point where the strangling's happening, but I'm pretty much ready to strike in the way that a cat would pounce, right? Wow. And yeah, so if I've had some situations where I'm defending other people um, or sometimes just interrupting a line of sight because if they have disturbances, internal stimuli, um, they might like lock on to a female, one of my peers I'm with, this has actually happened. And for whatever reason, they don't care about me. They're not interested. They're just like, they, they're they gunning for her. They hate her. They have some false memory in their head. Mm. And I've kind of observed what's happening. And then I think, I'm just going to step in the way. So now they're looking at me. Yeah. And that kind of distracts them and, and fortunately usually ends the situation. But um, but for one, yeah, we I try to block their line of sight. And then that way, that's out of their mind, Who whatever rage they were expressing there and and then too of course i'm blocking the path so they have to go through me to get to a peer of mine mm -hmm. yeah wow that was a bit of a tangent wasn't it <laughs> that's okay um, from what yeah martial, martial arts <laughs> martial it's, arts it's almost served me very well yeah so it we'll sounds like yeah um tell me a childhood memory that you've never shared with anyone A childhood memory I've never shared with anyone. Oh my goodness. Okay. When we were children, we had these, I don't know what you call them, onesies, I guess. That's not what we call them when we were kids. I think we called them sleepers. You mean like the pajamas with feet? Paj pajamas. Ah, did we have feet on ours? Well, I don't remember the details about the feet. Okay. But... Yeah, we had... Like the one with the zipper. Yeah, we had okay. pajamas. I think we called them sleepers. I don't know if that's the technical term, but it's what we called them when we were kids. We had this long staircase that was carpeted for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really hard to vacuum and keep clean when you have... Because it's individual sections, individual steps, you know, with space in between each one. So you actually have to clean like 14 individual stairs, right? Um, not easy to do. But we, for some reason, my parents had these carpeted stairs, if you wore the sleeper, you can go um, sledding down the stairs. <laughs> just It would hurt like hell if I did it now, but when you're a kid, you don't weigh anything. It's sledding without the sled. And you go really fast, and you just you can somehow crash and not get hurt when you're a child. Right? <laughs> How old were you? Little, little. I'm, I, you know, five, six, seven. Okay. That era. Okay. That's something we did a lot. So I don't think I've ever really We as told. in you and your siblings? Yes, yes. It was a lot of fun. We just kind of figured it out. And I don't think most children had that opportunity because um, not everyone had those types of stairs that we had. So. Yeah. I have some carpeted stairs, so I'm not going to go try it out, though. No. I don't have a onesie. <laughs> no, those days are over. <laughs> yeah, us, yeah. So. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, what is one of your earliest memories of feeling love? These are some tough questions. Um, I mean, I was going to make you think you didn't know, <laughs> you didn't know I was going to probe into your, your deepest re recesses of your mind. Yeah. I mean, how do you define love anyway? Um, okay. Well, we could start there. How do you define love? There's love like parent to child and then there's love like your first girlfriend type mm -hmm. of thing when you're a teenager and, and hormones change and you're discovering things um i dated this girl in eighth grade this is actually i i'm sure i've had previous memories but this is the one that pops out the most go yeah we we figured out kissing like probably not long before that you mean like french kissing not like just a smooch both okay well, French kissing, I mean, that was just shoving your tongue down a throat back then because you thought that's what the method was. Um, everyone did. Um, Are we generalizing? I don't know. That I, I, th I, well, I didn't think that was the method, but keep going. For me and all my peers, I don't know about <laughs> you. Or maybe it, was just a, maybe it was just a thing for boys. Like boys thought they were supposed to do that. The girls never cared for it, but they never spoke up. So we all just kept did going that. for it. Mm. Um there was this girl, I figured, you know, it, it took her a while to get her to like me. She really resisted that at first, even when there was like the peer pressure because people knew that I liked her. Mm. And I was just being so relaxed about it. I wasn't even expecting anything. And um, at some point she realized she did like me and I was a great guy. 
and there was this this point, you know, I'm again still trying to figure out what love is and everything. This is all very new and very exciting relatively. And um and there was this one point where she realized she liked me a lot. And um despite kind of the resistance she had at first, she pulled in to kiss me. Mm. But very very impulsively and very quickly. And and that was kind of when I knew I had broken her barrier. Not that I was even trying to do that, you know, but she realized she liked my company and I'd been her friend actually for about a year. And um, the thing is, she liked me so much she forgot she was wearing this hard brimmed hat. And and it it popped me right in the forehead and I had <laughs> acne. I was a teenager. <laughs> it was extremely painful and also very loving at the same time. So that is one of my <laughs> most recent memories. And um, I mean, I haven't had pimples in a while but if you can imagine a hard brim slamming right into some acne or some pimples it's not fun yeah yeah okay but so. you did appreciate that she was making the move i forgave her pretty quickly yeah. yeah okay it was just it was funny painful exciting all at the same time that's fun yes um okay so what was it like to grow up in your family tell me about that um there was this um, perception that my parents had wealth. I think that's relatively true anyway. I don't really know much about their financial situation. I know it's in the toilet right now. I mean, my dad's on his third marriage, of course, but um, we had a swimming pool. So that helps. You know you got some money if you have a swimming pool. I think there was a lot of security with that notion. There's just like, okay, we have a pretty decent sized house. We've got a big deck and a swimming pool. And I think there was, again, just that sense of security when you're a child that you're like, oh, I don't think we're one of those poor families out there. You know, we're feeling pretty good about that. We could basically do whatever we wanted to. Hmm. Um, not that we had a lot of interest back then, but I would say we had that. It was a pretty good start to my life. Hmm. Definitely. The uh, the drama stuff happened after I moved out of the house. Okay. So, whew, good good timing. Are <laughs> <right? laughs> hey, yeah. your parents still uh, on good terms? Speaking um, of divorces, I don't know if you call it good terms. I I think it's it's just politics stuff. It's about there's just business that needs to be done, and they may as well communicate and work together amicably when they when they have to. Mm. But I think they're just kind of. Um, it's not out of bitterness, but they're just simply not really talking to each other that much just because they live in two different areas, two different lives now. So it took a while, though. You know, it, it th I think it was, the, like I said, a three-year divorce process. So it wasn't good terms for a while, that's for sure. Yeah. How long did it take for it to become more neutral? Um, see, that's the thing about living away at that point. Um, you don't know. I don't really know because I only know what I could see and what I could hear. And I, at the same time, I'm trying not to pry or be too curious and, and I'm doing things I'm developing my life. And, mm -hmm. um, there's just, there's, there's some things that kind of, um, you will get sucked into it when you can't afford to be like when the parents have to fight with each other about who goes to your college graduation, that kind of thing. You're just like, you know, I'm I'm not even really making any demands here, honestly, mm -hmm. but somehow I'm caught up in this mess and I don't want to be. So so I can't really say because I distanced myself from that as much as I could. Do you feel like yeah. they held it together until you left based upon the fact that they wanted to keep the family intact while you I, and your I siblings were in it? do not know because there were some – events that transpired that I think triggered the divorce and the separation. And I'm not sure if I have a timeline on those events or if I even know what it is exactly that triggered that. It's uh. probably a number of factors, right? But so it's really hard to say because gosh, 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 this was two decades ago now. So okay. yeah, it, it'd be very hard for me to say. Okay. So what makes you feel loved? These are the sorts of questions I really need to spend more time on, self-reflecting mm -hmm. 
And that might be because of my job and spending so much time kind Focusing of outwardly focused. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what makes me feel love? Pro- something to do with just the sort of like the blindness in it all, you know, I and mean, you're just so focused on someone that you forget about your sensibilities, you forget about your sense of embarrassment, freely holding hands, dancing in public, that kind of things, and the whole rest of the world cease to exist. I know it's kind of cliche, but it's very true, and it's a great feeling. And then um, contrary to that, there's it's, I don't want to say it's a terrible feeling because if I'm still dating someone I like, but it's less of an exciting type of love when someone feels like they have to regulate it a little bit, you know? So I, I really like that kind of love where just the girl you're with, the person you're with, they just do not care where they are there with you. And that's all that matters. And everyone else stops existing. And they're all degree. in. They're all in. Hmm. Yeah, as opposed to like, no PDA, we're in public, we can't hold hands, we can't be silly right now, we can't be playful. And it's like, well, I don't exactly want to schedule this stuff. <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's probably big for me. Okay. What has been your biggest lesson in love? Um, Going back to what we were talking about regarding divorce rates and predictors and things like that, it's probably that it's completely unreliable, particularly when you're younger, just because that's simply what the research shows. Age when you're first married, right? Probably not a very reliable um, thing to launch uh, a marriage off of. And um, now I was never contemplating marriage when I was younger, but I think love when you're younger, of course, it, it can change at any minute. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's really a problem if we recognize that's the nature of love, that it can be fleeting, it can be ephemeral, it can be uh, finicky. And um, the problem is we we like to pretend that that reality doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so probably the biggest lesson of love through um, breaking other people's hearts and having my own heart broken is just like, wow, it really isn't reliable. You know, it can change any minute really. And you won't necessarily see that coming, but we know that the odds get better as you age. Mm. Good answer. Do you have any boundaries when it comes to love? Not really. No, not really. Okay. Um, no. I don't think so, to be honest. Have you ever become addicted to or obsessed with love? No. I mean, I, you know, had some excited thoughts when I was an adolescent, but but barring that, no, I, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I've been pretty secure, actually, um, with my attachment style, so. Are you secure? Attachment? I, it's one of those things. It's like love languages. I've never actually sought that <laughs> stuff out. I spend so much time talking about related things, related concepts that it's just I sometimes I stop asking myself questions because it's like I've got 30 other people a week. Hmm. I need to give this sort of energy to, right? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It, it's like if you are a, a, a chef or, or someone who makes a certain type of food all day, you might not want to eat that food when it comes to be your dinner time. Mm-hmm. Not because it doesn't work for you. It's just because you want something different, right? So what is your dating life like? My dating life right now? Yeah. It, it, my, my dating life right now is a very adventurous one. Um, well, you know what I, I seek in a woman, what I appreciate based yes. on a, a previously what we talked about here. Um it's tricky to find that in Portland, as you can probably infer based mm-hmm. on the content of what we talked about before. So a lot of my dating life has to do with things happening outside of Portland. Okay. And that makes me so sad to say that. Um, no, I do go on I do go on dates in Portland and I go on some really good ones actually. Um, but I have so many just vivacious experiences outside of Portland. Like you travel. Um, to go see someone. Travel. It's not even that I particularly travel to go see someone. It's more that I participate in travel and life and doing different things. That could be a festival. Um, it could be it could be Burning Man. Great stories from Burning Man. And people who I still stay in touch with, right, who I met there. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be a, I, I just got back from Vietnam, for instance, and um, I've been there numerous times, actually. I've been to 30 countries now. So I've experienced a lot of different love in a lot of different countries and um, call it excitement, but it tends to be a little bit more rewarding, I think. Why? 
Um, part of it is the novelty, of course, but I, I'm wise enough to know the difference between, well, this is just excitement and then this is something real that I should stick by for a bit. So um, part of it is you do have, going back to those effeminate qualities, those traditional ones you kind of miss because you don't get them in Portland, not as much anyway, harder to find. Um, you get them in certain other countries that are more conservative and um, you just realize like, wow, this is actually really refreshing and um, it works quite well for me. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Yeah. Even if it's short term because you're only there for a little while. Well, sometimes I'm there for a long while because I, I, I have the privilege of being able to stay out a little bit more extensively. So it's, we're not talking about a two week vacation here. Hmm. Um, when it comes to like multiple relationships or multiple partners in a given trip, it's it's not because I chose, okay, I want this to be short term and just want to have flings. It's more like, no, I, I want something long term, but eventually I have to switch locations or leave. And sometimes what that means, it's like, well, I'm in a new location now, so I'll start dating someone new, or it just means it inevitably has to come to an end. But I, I don't think the lessons are lost with that. Of course, it still benefits my soul greatly by having experienced that traveling itself you don't live in the country you visited but you still keep that with you for a while mm -hmm. right same thing if you discover a new romance or relationship so i do date in portland but not as much as people would believe in hmm. fact i'm trying not to date too much in portland to be honest i'm just why i'm taking it easy we'll say that um we'll say i'm taking it easy i'm i'm biting my energy very well Right. And there's so much going on. I mean, there's a lot of business development going on right now, and I'm devoting a lot of my energy to that. I'm actually expanding beyond Portland. I mean, I technically have been for a while, but I'm not just the Portland dating coach anymore. So I'm I'm expanding to a more national level, which is really exciting. And even but without having really marketed that too much yet, I still sometimes get calls from the East Coast and I and I say, you know, you're in New York. Why did you call me all the way over in Portland, Oregon? Why not hire someone in New York? And I said, well, it's because you had the, you know, the mock dating service that I really liked. And mm. I was searching for that specifically. And you're one of the very few people who does it. I'm mm. like, oh, wow, that's really cool. So I'm kind of focusing more on those aspects, realizing that people find me from all over. And sometimes that means, you know, if I'm doing that much business development, I don't have as much time for dating. And that's perfectly fine right now because I'm I'm very, very content and I don't have to think about marriage until I'm 40 anyway. So <laughs> I've got a few years. It's so interesting how you look at it. It's um, it's almost as if like talking to somebody who, you know, this is the first example that comes to mind in nothing about the age. But like when you're a kid and you're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And like somebody is so focused on, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a fireman. Or, right. It's like you have already predetermined that. I mean, what happened? What would happen if you actually found a potential partner between now and age 40? Would that be OK? Well, we just have to not get married. Um, <laughs> Okay, so it's you just know. marriage. It's the marriage part. It's not like the longevity marriage or is, commitment. It's just the marriage. Yeah. It's risky. Marriage is risky. And um, the longevity of it all, no. What you said, it's it's not all that bad. I suppose just if I have to give up a partner, it's one thing. But um, marriage and everything that comes with the divorce, completely. It's a whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah completely it, different situation. It so. is. Um, it, I think that the the best relationships I've ever had, I tend to walk into accidentally anyhow. Hmm. And so if you're exposed enough, and I teach my clients to do this too, if you're exposed enough and you're living life and you're doing things and you're out there, you're inevitably going to accidentally encounter people and fall in love and have relationships. And um, therefore, I don't have to put quite as much investment on a more formal dating process anyhow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. I'm with you. Um, okay, so have you found, because I've read some articles about this, um, let's talk about dating apps for a second, because you're kind sure. of the opposite of that, right? Um, or maybe you encourage your clients them. to use them yeah. too, but uh, my perspective on that is they're kind of like the 
the seasoning to your food, not necessarily the meat or, you know, the, the full sure, course. Sure, that's a good way to look at it. So, right, you're not like just relying on that. Like you mentioned, you know, having a full life or getting out there and having different pursuits and interests and you're going to eventually, you know, run into relationships and run into love, right? But in the perspective of dating apps specifically, because <clears throat> I've been on them too, um, you know, there is a huge um, ratio of men to women specifically. And um, that's at least been my experience. A dating app is uh, completely overwhelming. I can speak for a female just based upon and this is going to sound terrible, but how much attention you actually get is mm -hmm. kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, even if it is with somebody that's totally passive, that's like, let's just hang out. Uh, you know, you might get 10 or 12 of those repeatedly, regularly. Yeah. And so um, the ratio of men on dating apps versus women on dating apps tends to be higher. Would you agree? Yes, I would. And why do you think that is? Well, um, it doesn't take much for an initial attraction with men. If you've got looks, you've got enough. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to sustain into something greater than just, you know, first date, but it's enough to catch your interest for sure. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of men will simply swipe right on anyone who looks good. And um, and and I would too. But once we start dating, of course, I'm going to need a little bit more than that, right? And every now and then I see someone who's like, just, wow, they're really physically attractive. And then you actually read their profile and you're just like, eh, never mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do not want to meet this person. But, <laughs> but we are, we're all using apps very quickly. We're not spending much time looking at the profile. I, I tell clients it's like, it's like reading a giant stack of resumes on your desk for one job. You have to be efficient with your time. Yeah. You're spending 20 seconds skimming the resume and you're not, you're, it, there's no such thing as a yes pile. It's either the trash bin or it's the maybe pile. It's yeah. like the callback pile. Yeah. So what you're doing that first round is you're just skimming, skimming, skimming. And we pretty much swipe the same way. I don't need to have a perfect yes or no even when I'm using dating apps, I'm looking at women's profiles, but I do need to skim it really quickly because I've got a whole stack of them to go through. Mm-hmm. I like the way you put that. Therefore, you have a lot of men who are swiping right on women because all they need is that looks and there may be other things to it, but they're not necessarily reading that the first time around. Mm -hmm. and that so could be part of it. You you actually help people with their profile, right? I do. Okay. And are there specific like directions or uh oh yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah there's all, there's all sorts okay all sorts of what directions. you got for um, us what, you, what have you learned about that in that quick profile scan um are there specific things that you need to hit on that might grab people's attention yeah of course it's different for men and women but um if there's one thing you could fix, if you could change, it's the amount of investment you put into the profile. Does it look like you're using this seriously? So if I'm looking through a woman's profile and her photos are just kind of just the offshoot, some lazy selfie and um, just not a quality photo. She just looked like she wasn't even trying. Mm. You know, some, maybe she was at a party had the beer in her hand kind of thing. I mean, not only is that kind of obnoxious in itself, but it just looks like I, I'd be wasting time with this girl because I don't know if she's really using this app sincerely. I could maybe get on a date. I could maybe connect with her, but um, is she mature enough? To, does she care enough for this, right? I could just be wasting a bunch of time. That's also true for women going to men too. The more invested you look in our profile, the better. Absolutely. And so you do have to think about things like, what are you wearing? Is it just very casual? Uh, with men, it's very casual. <laughs> Typically, it's a big problem for them. It's like a tank top or a t-shirt and some shorts. And um, no, actually, like like put on a I, something like what I'm wearing right now. It's not too much. It's not over the top. But it just shows like, I kind of wanted to look a little bit nice for this. And usually the feedback you get from women and men is they they start saying things like, well... But then I'm not really expressing who I am. I'm not representing who I am. This is just a lie. It's just a facade I'm putting on. And yeah, it's fake. 
But it's not because it's not any more fake than when you go into a job interview, you're going to dress to impress, not because you need to be a fake to make it in the world, but because you're showing the person who's going to be hiring you potentially that you're taking this seriously. It's important to you. And that you care. You care. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Same thing with the first date itself. Same thing with the profile. Show them that you care. Um, Once a long time ago, when I was a confused college student, I did a a management interview for Target, you know, Target, and they wear these red shirts and I think like khakis. Yeah. And it it didn't take, of course, because I didn't have the experience I needed, but they're very casual actually with their policy, you know, just red shirt and khakis, right? They don't expect people to dress up. I did it anyway for the interview because if I go there looking casual, these people think that I'm not taking it seriously and um, certainly don't want to go in there just with a baseball cap on and um, some shredded up t-shirt, right? It doesn't matter your qualifications, you're not getting hired because you do not care. So you have to think about that same concept, that same principle when it comes to apps. And so yeah, you should put on your nice clothing. It's just a first impression. You're not misrepresenting yourself. You're simply communicating to someone who has not spoken to you that you care about this process and that they are worth the time. Mm-hmm. What about answering questions? Um, what do you mean? Like, well, depending on the app, asks you questions, right? And oh, so, like prompts? Yes. Oh, and prompts. So- oh, those things are horrible. I wish, <laughs> I wish they didn't exist because before prompts, you got to write about self descriptive information, free form. Uh huh. And not everyone loved that. But prompts only exist because apps had to keep having a a new way to one-up each other to revolutionize over the other one. And so prompts kind of came out of that and it's like, oh, new, it's fun, you know. Um, The thing is, a lot of the prompts are very unattractive and they hurt you, but people think that they're fun, so they want to use them. And uh, I'm going to give you some gold right now, okay? This is the type of stuff I share with paying clients. So, And you can broadcast this, I don't care. (laughs) I have plenty of content here. There's three prompts that really hurt people. There's three types of prompts that really hurt people. Okay, go. And people are using them obliviously, of course. The first one is any prompt involving negativity. And that, when I say negativity, I mean literally subtraction. Okay, the minus, negativity, okay? So anything that describes you don't want this, you're running from this, um, this is what you are averse to, that's going to make you look unattractive. But there is always a positive correlate to that. So this is what you do want. This is what you're looking for. This is who you're looking for. Much more attractive statements come from that. So you always have to look at the prompts and the directionality of those prompts. And um, whatever it is, you know, I say there's uh, there's a famous case I had where someone said, uh, I don't hang out, I, I don't date cigarette smokers, I don't even associate with cigarette smokers or pot smokers. Um, it doesn't matter if the person reading that is a smoker or not. They're thinking like, gosh, this person's kind of an asshole. Um, or closed off. Yeah, yeah. kind of closed or off or just stingy. Or- you know, I have friends who do that. And, you know, sometimes I smoke pot or at a party I might have a cigarette. But And what if you were a perfect fit for that reader, but they see that and they think, oh, this guy, I don't know. Um, I'm going to pass. Yeah. You could be killing a lot of potential. Okay. So instead of saying you don't date smokers, say you value people who lead a healthy lifestyle. You know, positive correlate of a very similar message, almost the same thing. Right. Much more attractive. The second thing is you don't want to choose prompts that are completely irrelevant to who you are and they don't actually describe anything. So that would be the ones that are like, here's a favorite movie quote. Uh, (laughs) Debate me on this topic. (sighs) My most controversial opinion. um, Okay. Pineapple goes on pizzas. I know it sounds fun, but someone's reading this profile trying to decide if they want to date you or not. And they're not really getting any information about who you are, your personality, what you love to do, if you'd have common interests. Because no one's actually going to say, hey, hey, you you share my same thoughts about pineapple and pizza. It's a perfect match. Of course not. They want to know what you do, <laughs> what your values are, what you're seeking. So it sounds fun. And this is that's why I hate prompts, because they're misleading. They look like fun, but they actually hurt a lot of people. Mm. Whereas I think a lot of people wouldn't think to write something like that on their own if it were just free form. And then lastly, the third type of prompt you have to be really careful of are are ones that I'm going to say they're not present oriented. So they they get you to talk about something that happened in the past or in the future, but it's not reflective of who you are now. 
Mm. And that looks like a life goal of mine is this, or give me travel tips for this. I could say a life goal of mine is to um, hike and kind of climb all the Andes mountains, um, hike the Inca Trail in Peru. That is an actual goal of mine. Am I going to do it anytime soon? I don't know. I'm going to I'm gonna try, but a lot of us have these far off kind of goals and um, that has nothing to do with who I am now, who you might be dating, right? So it's much better just to start with things that are present oriented. And the same goes for going too far into the past. You might say you have an interest in certain things. Um, you might say that, you oh yeah, you're, you're really interested in hiking. And, and then when you get down to it, well, it's actually been 10 years since you've really done any hiking. I don't know if that's really the case for anyone in Portland, but the, <laughs> the point is, if you haven't talked about or touched this stuff in a while, you might want to be careful with it, listening as an interest. I say go by the evidence. What have you actually been reciting? What have you been doing? Hmm. Right? That speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. the, the claim, the words itself don't mean much. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So those are the three types of prompts you really got to be careful of. Okay. And prompts probably do more harm than they do good, unfortunately. Stick to the ones that describe you. You know, the things that are actually, I am this. These are the three things that I love. That kind of stuff. Mm. Okay. Because we need to get to know who you are. Yeah. And quickly. And quickly. Mm -hmm. You got about 10 seconds, in fact. Right. And then it's on to the next. So. Um, how do you, or how can we handle rejection and not becoming obsessed? There's a lot of rejection out there in the dating world. So maybe you have some insight on that. I don't know how much peer reviewed research there is on this, but a really great way to bolster your self esteem mm. and your defense against rejection. I sometimes say getting declined because it it's softer than rejection. And the truth is, a matter of times we're declined. It wasn't rejected. It was just oh, you're not quite for me. But it's not you know, shove you away. Um, a really great defense for that is simply to have alternatives. In anything in life, by the way, if, uh, for example, if you suffered a sports related injury and it stopped you from doing that one thing that you love, you're going to be pretty depressed. And of course, there's a lot of people going through that who do get injuries, right? But what if that wasn't the only thing that you had that kept you going? Mm -hmm. What if it was like, well, you know, I still really love culinary arts and I'm pursuing that as a passion. Mm -hmm. um, I told you I, I had to stop dancing for a while because of the pandemic, right? Right. That didn't get me down. I, I bolstered up some of my other interests. Right. I was rock climbing and doing other things like that. And so um, that really is just the, the method of having alternatives. And so when it comes to rejection, that hits us really hard. Of course, it always stings a little bit. There's just no getting around that entirely, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a lot of options, or you at least have the potential to generate more options, it doesn't hurt as badly. It really doesn't, okay? Because you didn't really have to put all your eggs in one basket in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. Anything with life. If you only had that one career you could pursue and it didn't work out and then, you know, you're defeated, it's horrible. But what if you had multiple interests and just, you know, that thing didn't work out or I wasn't very good at it. Um, that's okay. I have this other direction I kind of want to chase a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much, much easier. So, yeah. So have options, right? Generate options, definitely. And just have that great profile and get good at talking to people, practice meeting strangers, shaking hands, things like that. And so if you don't have any immediate options, at least you can always say, you know, I'm going to go get out there and meet someone new tonight. You'll feel much, much better about rejection. How do we handle ambiguity or um, someone who isn't ready for a commitment? Um, that's a tricky one because that's something you can't really control. That's, that's their inner turmoil and um, their circumstances. And there's really not much you can do about that. You could say the best thing you could do about that is to shut up and give them space. I mean, it's literally like if, if they are asking for, you know, I need some spa space. I, I don't know about this. I need to think, give them what they're asking for. You know, if you want them to like you, give them what they're asking for. And so of course the opposite happens when you ramp up the pressure, right? And you don't give them that space and you bug them even more. Um, mm -hmm. That's the best answer I have for that one. Cause for the most part, you just can't control whatever they're processing. It's just personal for them. And it's not your life, of course. 
but best solution is give them some space, let them do their processing, lay off for a bit so they know that you're not being demanding and needy and obsessive, and then they can actually feel relaxed and more comfortable around you. Yeah. How can we see our partner clearly? How can we see our partner clearly? Or the person that we're dating. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm still trying to figure it out. For sure. It's not an easy <laughs> that, task. That feels good. That feels yeah. good. Yeah. It's the sort of question I don't get that much because I mostly work in stages like beginning of the relationship stages. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's a tricky one. That's a challenging one for me. Definitely. I mean, I judge everything based on, again, kind of the action speaking louder than the words. Hmm. Okay, because the, the words are always so unreliable. Like mm -hmm. I call the I I we have what we call claims, just the thing you say you like, you're interested in, etc. That's always the claim. And then there's the proof, the evidence, like what are you actually doing? Right. And so I'm I'm a very practical, very pragmatic coach. And um I teach people like, you know, if if you're gonna say you like this thing, then you know, prove it, right? Actually enact it, make it actionable, or it doesn't count for anything. So so I think you you could um, you could even look at things like uh, going to love languages, gift giving, and things like that are really really huge because it's it's an action and it's not just words. Mm -hmm. And I think you you can see I probably have a preference towards that, right? Yes. As opposed to just like words of affirmation, which are important, they have a place, but yeah, I can't rely on those uh, just by themselves, can I? No. Right. Yeah. Or at least I can't no, 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 <laughs> I'll no. speak for myself. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Um, yeah. So along that same line, how do we trust that they feel as deeply or as strongly as we do? Oh, you can't trust it. No, that's that's the point, right? You don't know what's going on in their head. And, and that's what trust is. It's just you don't know. And you're going to do it anyway. That's exactly what trust is. It's much better than to, um, it's much better simply just to say, I don't know if I can trust them. I'm going to give this a, a go anyway. Let's give it a whirl. Okay. That's, that's trust really. So I, th I think instead of asking, you know, how can you know if you can uh, trust them or any similar question, it's much better to just say, you know, I don't know if I can, but um, it's more about you at that point. Just what are you going to do with the information you have? Mm -hmm. right? What choices are you going to make? How are you going to carry it? Mm -hmm. And less about what you put on them because you can't control them anyway. Mm -hmm. How do we come to a place of acceptance that not every person we feel something deep and moving with is meant to make a home with us or meant to be with us forever? It really, it sounds so clinical in a way or academic, but it really helps just to like study trends and real life. For instance, with the divorce, you tend to feel better about it when you know that everyone else is going through it too. It's, you're not an anomaly, right? right. It's just, it's so normal now. Mm. Um, when you can accept that as just, oh, this is actually just part of the dating marriage process these days, right? Whether it should or shouldn't be, I think that would help a lot. Honestly, just actually do some research, study some trends, right? Find out what's going on with everyone else here because you might not be alone in that regard. So, hmm. How do we recognize deep down inside that our partner isn't good for us? Yeah, that's a tricky one because you're pro probably blind to some things while you're caught up in it. This is where, um, this is where an objective presence comes in right and that's why we have therapists and things like that because you just cannot think clearly when you're the one wrapped up in the relationship so so how do we recognize when someone's not good for us mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question um it's not my area of expertise because i don't teach people how do you stop dating a person kind of thing. <laughs> I, I can stop as I say. That would are, be yeah. a great, that would be a unique profession. <laughs> I, I get asked those questions sometimes, I, I but I don't have very good answers for them. It's people always ask me like, if I need to break up with the girl, what's the best way to do that? And I'm thinking, who cares? You're bre you're breaking up with her. There's no best way. It's going to suck for her no matter what you do. Yeah. And so I try my best to give some advice there, but it, it's ultimately it's inconsequential if you're not seeing her anymore and she's not seeing you anymore. 
Um, you don't have to worry about the, the future there, do you? Not for the most part. So yeah, that's a pretty tricky one because you're usually blind to these situations if someone's not good for you. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how to answer that, honestly. That's okay. Um, let's see. How do we move on and date after we've been hurt? Yeah, so that one definitely takes time, no matter what. Time time heals all, right? You've heard that before. It turns out it's true. But um, you have to, I, I think when you've been hurt, you're in what we could call a sensitive situation. As an analogy, you go out, let's say you get a bad sunburn. You're pretty sensitive to the sun for a while, aren't you? You know, even just to walk outside for a minute or something, if you've got that burn, your your skin is reacting against it. It's just like, no, no, that's the thing that poisoned me. Um, so it's similar with like, say, a bad breakup or when you've been really hurt, you're very sensitive to it. So actually, the best thing to do is to simply avoid that trigger, that, that stimuli, which could practically mean you should not be dating for a while. Hmm. What it does mean is it means go with something safer, go with friendships. Hmm. So it's it's pretty basic. Go with your friends. There's no risk, very little risk of getting hurt or rejected by them. So it's a pretty safe deal. Yet the rewards are just they're they're incredible. You you can get very far with friends emotionally, and um, you don't have all the risk. It's really a wonderful thing having friends, honestly. And then of course there's hobbies. There's um, what I call growth oriented activities, or sometimes what I call adventure activities which means you're not just doing leisure things like reading or video games, um, but you're doing things that help you develop or grow in some sense. Now, you don't want them to be, um, you don't want it to be all leisure and you don't want it to be all like risky adventure necessarily either because sometimes that's too stressful or too overwhelming or too much, but you want some kind of balance between those two things. It's part fun, part relaxing, then part, okay, you're pushing your limits a little bit here and, and growing. I think that stuff really, really helps. Hmm. Okay, but yeah, honestly, I'm for some of my clients who just went through a bad divorce, I'm saying I don't think you should be dating for a while. I think you have a lot of ex friendships you could be exploring more. There's a lot of fun things you could be doing in life that are not going to you know burn you again, just like that sun that caused the initial sunburn. And is yeah. there a specific time that you recommend to people? A specific time period? Yeah. Um, it's going to vary a lot, of course, but I'm usually telling people uh, just by experience, you're probably going to need one to two years. And then it just depends on the level of like trauma and how amenable the whole divorce situation was. Um, again, definitely not perfect, not a very reliable figure, but I have worked with a lot of people who are, of course, want to start dating. So they hire me. And then at some point they change their mind to say, okay, I'm not ready for this. And they have crying fits and and they realize, and I realize, okay, you, this is still way too fresh for you. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. probably one to two years. Okay. What do you think is the point of a relationship? Um, great question. What is the <laughs> point of a relationship? The best form of happiness is shared happiness. Mm. Really? That's the point of it. It's 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 fun simply to participate in things together. Um, it's not about need. Not at all. It's about want. Yeah, that's the point of the relationship, shared experiences. Great answer. How can we incorporate more love in our lives? Um How can we incorporate more love in our lives? I think it, it first of all, it, it comes from the self, which I know sounds cliche, but I really mean you have to like figure out who you are first. If love has to do with the merging of two identities together, you kind of need to figure out what your identity is first before you can do that. Okay, so it's very simple like that. It's a very simple equation. A lot of the people who are having trouble with um, finding love, identifying love, or merging their identity um, simply have not taken time to figure out who they really are. They were just, they were doing very basic things. I go to work, I check out from work. Sometimes I watch a football game on TV, things like that. 
those people are having some trouble because they're not actively exploring what what actually makes them feel like love for themselves. It could be anything. It could be mountain biking, right? It could be cooking, absolutely. It could be whatever you want it to be. So yeah, hobbies, um, activities like that, again, back to that self-growth kind of concept, pushing your comfort zones, that's a pretty big part of it. And that also means having um, and not foregoing relationships that are just more at the platonic level too, but what I call the intense platonic level, you know, close friendships, absolutely huge, huge, huge. How do you feel we can incorporate more love for ourselves and the world around us? Love for ourselves and the world around us. I think it's similar to my last answer. Okay. And that there's just a point where you think you're striving for one thing. You know, I want a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And um, maybe you're not ready for that yet. But maybe this just amazing accident happens later on. You're getting out. You're participating in life. Hobbies, activities, friendships, events. You know, just few friends coming over, pizza, things like that, sharing that, that's a really great start because sooner or later things do start happening when you least expect it. I think a lot of the best relationships are accidental ones. I think that um, mm -hmm. simply social networking, I almost hate using that word, but social networking is actually really important. It's exponential. You know one person, they are a resource to introduce you to other people down the line, either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. Some of the amazing women I've met were simply just introduced me through my networks somehow. Not necessarily like, hey, Eric, let me set you up on a date with this girl I know. But I got invited to an outing and someone brought someone and that person brought someone and, and then I met someone, right? And it's completely accidental. So so yeah, the social networking is really powerful, which means you have to have just an essential lifestyle that involves going out with friends, making new friends, being able to meet new people, feeling comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with that, you have to get comfortable with that. You have to practice that as a skill, right? Work through your shyness, uh, work on participating in life. Thinking about these growth-oriented traits where you're going to get out and push your comfort zones here, not just stay and do the safe stuff like the reading or the video games which too many people are doing in Portland anyway. Yeah. A lot of people like those activities, so. And that's a generational thing too, I think. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, my daughter, who is considered, I guess, a millennial, right? Sure. She grew up sure. doing gaming, right? <laughs> so that is kind of her go-to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. For social. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not like I had, you know, Nintendo by the time I was in junior high and Atari before that. So right. that was not our go-to. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's okay to have that stuff in your life. You sure. just you just can't depend on it. You know, how is this actually going to better you? How are you going to meet people doing this? It's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, because you're stuck behind a screen. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Well, thank you for all of your information that you were willing to share. Of course. Anything else? Anything else for me? Um, yeah, you've been asking me a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. um, what's next for you in your practice and what you're doing? Um, in like my business? Yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, and you probably have heard from your other clients, divorces take an extreme amount of energy. Yes. So I'm not quite finished there. I hope to be finished in this next month or so of getting a ruling. Um but in the meantime, I can't say that my business is taking a back seat. My mid business is definitely not where you are in a growth period. I was very focused on dealing with a lot of the emotions that came with the divorce sure. as well as the demands that came with the divorce. It's not a usual divorce. Um, that being said, um, this next year, I... Well, at least in this next six months, I have two retreats that I'm planning and I tend to do a couple every year. So that's something that I'm doing. I'm looking into, it's interesting because you were talking about counseling earlier. I'm looking into master's programs um, here locally, both through PSU and Lewis and Clark and considering my master's uh, in counseling 
and, um, you know, really building out, I have a program really effectively building that out. I would like to build that out into a book eventually. Um, so I'm looking into that as well as I'm in the process of writing my own book. I've been saying that I'm going to do that since I went to college. I'm an English major. I think I mentioned that to you. So I've been working with actually a college friend and we've been meeting regularly and doing that as well. So I've co-authored several books, but I haven't actually written my own. So wow. that's something that I am looking into and working on as well. Um, let's see what else with my business. Uh, this, this is new to my business, the podcast. I had a podcast a number of years ago, but actually having a studio for it and working out of a studio and having it professionally edited and, um, yeah, and the video cool. and the, and the, and the audio in the, you know, the video in addition to the audio has been a really new part of my business as well. So, um, yeah, I can't say, I mean, I, I'm always working on something, but I can't say that, um, I have something specific that I am implementing this year per se. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like with me, it's just changes directions quite a bit. And yes. So, I never thought I'd be really expanding. I, I, I just wanted to be the Portland guy. Right. And, um, you might I have to know. change your name now. Yeah, well, I'll, I'm going to still stay the Portland guy no matter what, okay. a Portland dating coach. But I'm also um, expanding beyond that, just making sure I have a platform for beyond that. Mm. Um, I think I have a really unique program, what I do, especially with the mock dates and, and services like that. But but yeah, I'm always going to be Portland for sure. Absolutely. Right? Are you going to stay in Portland? I have no plans. Let's say I have no plans to go anywhere else right now. Okay. Yeah. I would have to really put some thought into where I want to be. I mean, I, I just can't stand the drivers here, but but that's not. <laughs> that's what you asked me at the beginning. That's I not see. getting me to leave. That's not enough. Okay. Yeah. How about the winters? I mean, <laughs> I guess you could say the winners when I usually travel. Anyway, oh, so. smart. You have yeah. that implemented. I just usually yeah. take a couple of vacations, but I've really been considering becoming a snowbird. Yeah, lately. Yeah, um, I can work remotely. So Me too. I'm very blessed to have that. Me too. I, can, um, I tend not to leave Portland for too long, but I might skip for a month and mm. maybe a couple months. Like I said, I was just in Vietnam, right? I was there for almost a couple months. And wow. That was a lot of fun. I bet. Um, did not mind it during the winter. I right? can imagine. You know. yeah. 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 So. Anything else? That was a great chat. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank I appreciate you. it. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Yeah.